actually are quite, I quite enjoyed waiting until I was 40. I felt much wiser and much more relaxed about things. So um, in hindsight, I'm not that disappointed that I had to wait uh, another 10 years before I got a management role um, and, in an operation. Uh, I do think it does help that um, you have a bit of wisdom and you've seen a little bit of um, experience as well. Um, my 30-year-old, my 30-year-old self probably would still listen to me. But, um, but when I, I sort of thought, well, I'm not very happy about that. I think I might leave. But then the company touched me on the shoulder and said, no, don't leave. We'll give you this particular, this other job. So I just finished my MBA. I got to do an international job where I was able to benchmark uh, and run conferences internally for the whole, uh, for the whole of the HP Billiton. So I pretty much went around to every single site in our company, over car and around coal or whatever. I just um, had a really, you know, really good time trying to help people share and, and learn those sort of experiences. Uh, even uh, I had to go to South America where they were speaking Spanish, so I went to um, Colombia, Peru, um, Chile, uh, and, and it was quite difficult um, trying to communicate in another language. Uh, take my head up to those people who can speak a couple. So there's a, bit of, there's a few photos of there of me in Peru, and I was at a quarry mine underground on a ski lift, um, doing the Spanish National Dance there. Um, Spanish National Dance there, that was in that was in the <coughs> area of Mine. I uh, went to the Cardi Diamond Mine, which is pretty amazing, it's just like a whole other planet there. And, uh, and there's, there's uh, some colleagues in, in South Africa and that's up in Colliery in, in Australia. So um, I've, I've had a, a pretty good time um, doing that sort of stuff. So as I said, I, I waited until um, I was 40 to have a, another management role. And actually, the, the lesson I've got around that is about planting the seed. Um, I had done some underground work and I was getting a little bit sick of um, you know, being underground, so I thought, well, how about I try open cut? So I used my networks and I got myself a job in open cut. And I went back on the tools and I learned how to do uh, life, um, you know, um, I learned how to do uh, my design and waste art plans and those sort of things. Um, and after a few years, um, like, you know, after a few years, I um, started to get noticed again and I think people noticed that I probably had some more capability than what I was doing. And I, I purposely took a step back to go on into it. So people tapped me on the shoulder and said, how about you do this job? How about you do that job? And I thought, well, actually, the job that I really want to do is be my manager. And I had seen in the organisation that there was a lot of contract stuff going on. And I had first class my manager's tip that I had um, enough operational experience. I've been in my contract for five years. You know, I, I sort of looked at the my managers who were out there and said, oh, I reckon I can do that. Um, but it was quite difficult because people always want to say, well, you go back to site and be a superintendent. I said, no, I don't really need to, to do that. I actually went to a talk um, by women in mining, oil and gas, and a lady at the front stood up and she said how important it is to try and think two steps ahead in your career. So try to think where you're going to be two years ahead. And then when you're having those conversations with people, you don't need to be demanding and say, oh, I want to be this by then. It's just like, I might like to try this in the future. I think I might like to go and be a mine manager at that particular site. I'm not too sure when that time is going to work for me, but, but it's something that I'd like to do. And what you're actually doing there is planting a seed in someone's head. And you're, um, and, and it, then it becomes their idea and much easier. So it actually took me, um, it took a lot of guts to, I had to go to my vice president and have a chat with him. And I knew I was going to get there. Well, how about you go back to site and do like a superintendent role? And then that will be over. We must be forgotten about forever. Um, and this lady who went to this oil and gas said that, a lot of people only remember the job that you're currently doing. Uh, they don't remember everything else that you've done. So sometimes you've got to be quite tactful and remind people, look, actually, I think I can cross this off here and here and here and here. Um, you know, I, I, I've done actually done that. So I think I'll just wait and I think I can actually do that. So that was an incredibly scary thing for me to do. But I sat down, I had the conversation, I got the, how about you go back to site and read superintendent? I said, no, you know what, because I've done this, this and this and this. And I've actually compared myself to the skills that are out there. And actually, you don't have a lot of pipeline of people, and I think I can, I can actually do this. So I um, went for the, the job the first time, I didn't get it. Um, and then um, I think it was the next time it came up, um, I you know, basically uh, I got the job the second time around, which was good. But it sort of took, um, probably took about a year to get, but that's what the power of planting the seed is. It might be bold, it might be a bit scary, but if you just put it out there and say it's something that you might like to do, people are aware of what you want. They're not brave, right. they're not mind readers. You're in charge of your own career, you're in charge of what you want to do. So it is important just to let people know what you're thinking about. If you might like to try something or do something, because it's much likely to come back to you then. 
So uh, I was in the mine for a little bit and I was always aware that we were going to buy our mining contractor. So I figured that I needed to get on the site. Uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was managing the contractor, so you know, get on top of that. And then I needed to really get on top of becoming a mine manager of the mine car because I don't even want to you know, involved in the underground mine. So it was quite bold to go and say, I'm going to be a mine manager of the mine car when I only really done it. So um, I thought I had a little bit more time to decide to buy a mining contractor a little bit earlier than we thought. So um, I came back from holidays, you know, having celebrated my first um, you know, performance review where I'd done really well and I got really good feedback and said it doesn't matter, you know, it was just wrong place, wrong time. I said, hey, we've decided that we're going to buy a mining contractor and we've done a deal and there's two mine managers and a contract mine manager and the manager and we'll find another job for you. And I was um, pretty devastated by that. But, but then, uh, you know, I, I was sort of quite forceful about what I wanted to do and I still wanted to be an operational manager. So they, they offered me um, to go and be the processing manager. So it was a, um, a 50 million ton, uh, you know, two plants uh, and, you know, a, a small crew. Um, I didn't have to look after the maintenance, so I just had to look after the operations. So, so um, that was, um, that was a pretty, pretty good uh, pretty good thing. So this is, um, this is sort of a picture from uh, where the, uh, trucks dump in to the crusher. So there's lots of different purveyors, so I've got very fit wheel coming around that, which quite pleased me. This is um, just a rainbow after a bit of a storm on one of our um, stop piles ready for the train. Uh, these are a the couple of the guys uh, on, on my crew from, from the shutdown, and there's a picture of me sort of just in front of the plant, and um, uh, I'm in a safety glasses, you know, approved areas, so I'm not standing out there. So not <laughs> <laughs> well, they ask you to take a photo, and then you get so I stood there in a safe place with something behind me. But I always have to explain that picture because people didn't have to so. Um, so I really enjoyed the plant, but I had pretty much, um, I had pretty much decided that, um, you know, it had been a with virtual ability and I would set it up for success. So what I did, I went in there and I made a 100-day plan and I said, you know, I knew nothing about it, but I sort of did a gap analysis between uh, what I could offer the guys and what the people in the group needed. And I identified that there was a superintendent there who, he really, he, he could be the manager, of the band, but he just needed a little bit more work. Uh, he just needed to be mentored a little bit. He hadn't done a budget before, um, and I just needed to show him the VH bulletin wise because all of these guys were contractors before. So I just brought them on side, um, I coached them, and then probably about um, six months later, I was able to um, resign. And then um, the, uh, the superintendent um, uh, was given the manager's job. You know, Previously, they thought he wasn't ready, but I made him ready, and uh, he was really wrapped, and he stood there and was having a good time. So that was, um, so that was pretty good. So that's some of my, that's that's, that's some of my, my journey. So the next thing I want to talk about is women in mining, and uh, that's a picture of us up at um, Colorado. So it's Angela. <laughs> so um, and I was pretty impressed by how many women were at um were at Point Rex. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Point Rex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rex. And what, <coughs> why, why am I in the photo? Because <laughs> you're on the board. Because you're on the Women Mining Committee, so... Um, <coughs> so, yes, so I handed it over to, to Rex, um, the Women Mining, so I was on the SMM board for, for six years, and um, as actually, as part of that, um, we get involved with various different committees, and for me, uh, I was never involved in Women Mining, if I got into the board in my areas of interest, I was involved with your summer awards, I was involved with the new leaders. I really wasn't involved with women in mining at all. I really didn't think there was any problems. I thought you should just get on with things and all of that sort of stuff. But that what happened was um, I, was at a, I was at a congress, which is where the board of committees and branches and board and just everyone gets together for an annual strategy session. Um, they all got together and then uh, the women mining committee stood up and said, oh, look, we've discovered that we've got a bit of a pay gap. We've done the, the survey results and we've actually got a bit of pay gap, and we can't really believe it. And then there was a fair bit of discussion in Congress around that. And then I realised that, and they asked me a few questions, and I, I found myself a little bit emotional when I was answering these questions, and then I suddenly realised, well, maybe everything is not okay, um, uh, and maybe there's something that I can actually give back to this. So I got involved with the Women in the Mining Committee, and I guess I realised I had my head in the sand for a good reason, because if you're positive and you think everything's okay, then everything will be okay. The minute you start thinking that things are wrong and things, are too difficult, then is that, is that going to bring you down? But anyway, I got involved um, with the committee, and I must say that um, uh, I must say that I was really 
uh, I was really impressed and I've made a lot of good friends out of it and it really has, um, you know, I've got a lot more out of it than, than I've been involved in. So I wanted to talk about a couple of the things that women in mining have been really fantastic, you know, with. And one of them is some of the networking um, events. So uh, this is, women in mining is quite a good one to be involved with because it's on the phone. So if you're remote and you're regional or you're FIFO or you're overseas and you can always participate and that's something that I always enjoy here. So I know I was always a bit of a phone caller in rather than a branch person. So that's, that, that sort of was quite good um, for me as well. Um, also, uh, there been, there's, there's a few events like the, um, we've done some regional networking events. So there's been a couple, I think, in Pilbara. There's been um, uh, the Steel Caps and Steel Lotos, which was um, a, pretty, a, pretty, was a pretty fun event. Uh, and um, that was up in Pilbara, and then um, Beatrice Dalton did one at the port. Um, so there's been there's been quite a few good events with the networking, and that's something that women in mining are really strong with. And that's something that really helps women, um, you know, uh, make connections. And you know, it's, it's sort of sometimes it's it's nice if you can just talk about things, and um, you know, that you're in it with other people, so it makes it a little bit easier. The other thing that women in mining um, are really quite good with. Is, is a mentoring. So they've um, set up a program, and one of the things that's been identified that you know, mentoring can really assist and it can just keep you going. For me, um, a personal story about mentoring was this is my, when I became a mine manager, I wanted to be very successful at that at that role. So what I did is I found myself a mentor. I said, well, who's, who's done iron ore before? Who's dealt with this particular contractor and, and to, tell, to tell the start of the tale? And also, who runs? So I picked someone who met all of my criteria for a mentor. And this guy here was my um, my husband's old boss. And so he said, yep, yeah, I'll be a mentor. I don't know how to mentor. And I said, well, I've done a mentoring course. I'll show you how to mentor. And we met every <laughs> every two weeks and we gave a list. And it was fantastic because he wouldn't let me get away with anything. If I was a little bit, you know, you, you have to set up your relationships with your bosses. And sometimes, you know, you want to get off on the right foot. But sometimes I might like, push you in a direction. You think, oh, no, I don't agree with that. And you go, no, that's wrong. You have to do that. So the next two weeks when I give him a phone call back, go, did you do that? Did you bring that up? I did, I was too scared not to. So it just really held me to account for the things that I needed to do. So this uh, so this picture was pretty good because we uh, we got to run the, um, some of the Gold Coast Marathon together at the end of that. We had just had mentoring for six months of period. So mentoring needs to be very structured, it needs to be for a set amount of time, it needs to be, you know, have agreements and it needs to be confidential and those sort of things. So um, just by accident we were both going over to the Gold Coast Marathon. So I was, you know, pretty wrapped. And what I gave him was a um <coughs> I gave him a picture, um, I gave him that, you know, glass bit of space to thank him um, for mentoring me at the end of it. So that's pretty cool. But uh, what the Women in Mining group in Western Australia has um, done, and that's hopefully going to be rolled out to Adelaide and Brisbane as well, is setting up a bit of a mentoring program. So what people do, um, mentors and mentees, uh, nominate their, uh, you know, what they want to get out of a particular relationship and then they actually match them up and then they meet over a, you know, maybe a four month period and they, um, the mentee, the mentee um, buys a coffee and they just talk for an hour and that's the only interaction they have for that, you know, they don't email between, it's just they meet for a couple of different areas, being highly successful. So they did it last year um, and they had 76 participants last year and this year we've got um, two terms, so I'm a mentor, um, for, I've just finished my first term of mentor as well, so it's been really good. And a lot of women are on the FIFO rosters who have actually got men as mentors as well, which is something that we <coughs> so um, it's been very successful. But a lot of people ask about mentoring, and that's, you know, and it does need to be, it does need to be structured, but you can just get informal mentoring. You just need to admire someone, admire something that you like about them and ask a question. You can just get that help with mentoring as well. The other thing um, that women in mind and stuff that I want to talk about is professional presentation. Um, and probably not so much, uh, so important in sort of the, when you were on my side and you and that sort of stuff. But it, I actually ended up running a networking event um, for it, this in, in Perth. Um, I guess I'd spent um, most of my career on my side in Hardyaka and I thought definitely needed to be judged on what I did, not how I looked. Um, and then when I was in the, the Perth office working, I definitely took the same approach to that. And um, a colleague of mine who's a very close friend said, look, you know, you look like a slob. <laughs> I said, just judge me for what I do. No, it's just not going to cut it. And so I went to um, I went to a networking event and, and there was someone giving a talk there and they 
they gave us a free card and what I used to do every five years, you know, when my colleagues have fallen apart, I just walk into David Jones with two grand or something like that and just say, dress me, you know, in one hour and I walk out there with all my bags and then I'll just buy for the next five years. So I just, I just don't bother about it. Um, but anyway, so I thought, oh, well, this person will be able to, I need some new clothes, so I'll just go to him and say, take your shopping. And there's a different approach to walking into David Jones and getting dressed. And she actually turned around to me, she goes, no, that's not what I do. She said, who are you? And I couldn't answer it. Who are you? Who are you? What are you? What do you want to convey? Um, and then I thought, oh my God, I was a little bit stumped. So then she goes, this is what I do. You know, I have a couple of sessions with you and we talk about who you are, what you want to convey, where do you want to go, how do you live your life? You know, are you are always on site and just want to do leisure clothes or will you, uh, do you want to do some corporate stuff? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Um, you know, so she helped me uh, work out who I was, how I wanted to present, uh, what I wanted to convey, how I wanted to live my weekends, uh, because I was quite embarrassed, frankly, because I was in a bottle shop after a run on a Saturday in really bad power pen trackies. I was stinky everything, uh, buying a bottle of alcohol for the afternoon. <laughs> so I said, like, oh yeah, I'll go with you to go on the board. And I went, no, this is not how I want to be. So I, it was like an MBA 101 style, and really I just learned, you know, it's about being respectful, it's about feeling really comfortable, it's like putting on a suit of armour that makes you feel confident. I learned about my colours, I learned how I should dress, I learned, you know, makeup, I never just wore makeup or anything like that. And it, it sounds vacuous, probably, but it's, it's, it's really not, it's just about you. For me, what it does is it focuses me when I want to go and do something. So if, for example, for example, you know, I want to communicate someone yellow tonight and and so that helps in communication and things like blue helps in credibility, those sort of things. If I want to get stuff done, I want to go to undies. Um, so, you know, it just, it just really focuses on the day and says, what do I want to do? What do I want to get done? And then what it does is it just makes you completely confident about everything you have to do for the day. And then and then it just it just lifts you up, it makes you shine, it makes people just accept you a little bit. And it's actually really important in, in the limited mining space as well because um, unfortunately there's a lot of unconscious bias that goes on. So people who are tall and attractive you get ahead of people who are uh, who are not tall and attractive. So even that's even for men. And, and so um, and that's that, that book. Oops, um, that's that book link. Um, that's a really good book. That's pretty much everything about what it's based off. And that, that book is saying that people who have unconscious bias and they don't realise they're having unconscious bias. So the example that they give in this book is that they actually talked about an orchestra and they never used to get women, in, they didn't have very many women in orchestras, uh, especially the ones who were playing big cellos and big trumpets. And so what they did is they did a blind audition behind, you know, sort of like the, um, the, the one the uh, music that you see on TV where they were spinning around in the chairs. What they're doing is trying to judge about, making a decision about how somebody looks, they're just trying to judge on that particular thing. So when they did this whole line of auditions, they even had people walking on in their socks so they couldn't tell whether it was heels or not. Um, they started getting more women in the orchestras uh, and more women were playing all these really big instruments. So it's just about keeping doors open and making sure they don't close before you get there. But even on site, uh, you can personalise and make yourself um, feel confident on site and just being professional by you know, tucking your shirt in and wearing a nice belt or wearing perfume or putting ribbon in your hair and saying, but, you know, being just being professional and caring about things can be really respectful and it can change the way you perceive as well. Um, so what I wanted to do was just go through a couple of book reviews. So please excuse me because I've got a little bit of a, a thing there. So um, what I wanted to do was just get up to date with the latest um, the latest thinking on um, being mining. And this is for guys and, and girls as well. So the first book is um, Set of Myths by Catherine Fox, and she's actually she actually worked for the Australian Financial Review, and she's got lots of facts and research in her book, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, and if you don't want to read the book, piece, she's got a podcast, and I've got the um, thing on the bottom. This will be I'm copying this on a stick for John, John Michael, but um, so it was on Radio National, so you can just listen to the he just listen to the talk without having to read the book, and it's pretty much uh, pretty much good. So. I just wanted to summarise what's coming out of her book, and her book is more around the organisational aspects of um, the barriers for women and getting getting women ahead. She interviewed a lot of business leaders over the years, and she ended up um, coming up with a whole lot of things um, things through research that she found. People were saying, like this, but that they actually weren't sure. 
and the first one um, we're doing is at work, um, places and meritocracy. So this is about the unconscious bias thing. So there's a lot of unconscious bias going on, and people think if they work hard they'll get there, but it's actually not true. You know, you know, tall, attractive men are getting ahead of other men and, and those sort of things. So um, you know, a con unconscious bias is still a big issue. The next one is. Um, People are saying the gender pay gap is exaggerated. So when you come out of uni, there's a little bit of a pay gap, but as you get more senior, there is still a big pay gap as well. And it's not really exaggerated, and it's not really moved in the last 20 years as well. So it still would have been a really big problem. Um, there are a lot of statistics around that, and they are quite rigorous as well. And uh, you know, financial institution, uh, financial companies are sort of a worse than mine company, so it's just my mind. It's, it's, it's across a lot of different areas as well. And the problem with that is it compounds into superannuation, time employment, and those sort of things. So the key thing about um, the gender pay gap is that good companies will actually uh, measure what their gap is and then have a look for the reasons and try to fix it. The next myth was that women, uh, women actually, not women don't want the um, don't want the top jobs, and many women are ambitious, but they sometimes get not the same reaction when they show their ambition, so a lot of women will hide their ambition from as well. So it's, it's sort of a big assumption to say women are not ambitious. Um, women are, are doing the right things, but sometimes they're getting the wrong outcomes in that. So uh, what they're really sort of, what she's really saying there is just, um, you know, it's about uh, leaders modelling appropriate behaviour, um, accepting behaviour, and, um, and, and letting women be, uh, encouraging women to be ambitious for women to be comfortable um, for themselves to be leaders. And measuring the cost of female turnover is also another measure of that. The next myth that was um, women with children um, don't want a career. So, um, you know, that they actually do. And, um, so, um, it's actually just, a, the study that's been done actually so shows that women are penalised for being parents where men are often rewarded for that, so it's about trying to, um, and it's all about companies also expecting 24 7. So um, there's sort of some different organisational aspects that are more comfortable for men than women. But women do, women and children do, do want a career. The next one is um, the quotas and targets are dangerous and unnecessary. So dangerous and unnecessary, and there's a lot of discussion about quotas. Um, there's been stuff in the financial review in the last week about it. Um, there's a lot of focus at board level because the ASX have put it on diversity guidelines, so now we're seeing a little bit of a shift in the top companies, and companies are really starting to look and say, well, what can we do, how can we get more women in there as well? Um, and, you know, that there are a lot of women to pick from, just not always uh, getting them onto the table as well. So again, it's about metrics, um, and it's also about trying to identify, you know, those people, who, you know, get those, to get those opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of fear around that, that you're going to be taking from one group to, to another. So that's why it often says, you know, that people often say, you know, it's, it's bad to have a, a target. Um, there are a lot of women now around with 30 years experience. So there's no reason why there shouldn't be, you know, an equal number of lawyers as well. Uh, the conversations that I've had, I was on a panel in Ernst, uh, for Ernst & Young in March, and also what's coming through the papers, it looks like quotas are really going to be coming onto the table. A lot of companies are getting quite serious about it as well. And it's unfortunate we've had to get to that situation, but hopefully it won't be forever, and hopefully it, it does force companies to have a bit of a look. The other one is that women should act more like um, more like men and not their own, their own worst enemies. So women get told they lack um, confidence and um, ambitions, ambition and being ambitious. Uh, women get told to lower their voice, they get told to change their clothes, their less jewelry, and all it's doing is sending women a message that they're not good enough all the time that they're lacking in some particular way. So it's it's well-meaning advice that tends to shut women down. So if you do sort of get told to do this or do that or be different from who you are, just recognise that for what it is and try and be yourself as much and try and be an authentic leader. Um, and time will heal all. So the last one was that, oh look, you know, the pipeline's going to mag magically appear, but you know, um, Catherine Fox has heard this for 30 years and it's not changing, so something else needs to change as well. So, you know, if you hear any of these myths, just be aware that they're myths and just um, just have a look at the conversation and the assumption and where that's going. This one's really for, you know, companies and organisations and those sort of things. The next book, 
FedEx book, which is LinkedIn, which is by um, Cheryl Sandler. <coughs> she's the CEO of uh, Facebook. So she's worked at McKinsey and she also serves at boards. And her, her book is really more targeted at women, so I uh, her to to be leaders. Um, I got quite a little bit angry reading this book, but after, you know, eventually, and, and so did a lot of my other you know, female friends who read this, they just basically, I got really angry at the start, but then, you know, when they got into it, they, they sort of, they got um, a little bit, um, a little bit more positive. But I actually was reading this um, before Darwin um, Congress, and I was actually just starting in consulting, and actually, this book was very helpful because I found out that I was actually doing a few things that this book was saying, and I needed to fix them, so I actually quite enjoyed reading that book as well. Her tips are, so she says to women, make sure that you sit at the table. So when she was giving uh, professional talks, she noticed women would sit around the edge, they would sit you know, front and centre in the room. So, um, you know, they'd always try and be small. So, you know, she's saying, encourage, you know, you, you deserve to be there, stand there, stand proud, be, be part of the room, don't sit on the, don't sit on the outline in the meeting, sit at the table with everybody else. And she also noticed that the questions women asked weren't um, as good as some of the questions men asked. So women would ask a lot of personal questions about themselves. And, guys would ask questions about the business. So also, when you're asking questions, just try and um, frame things as well. <coughs> the next one um, was about negotiating. So sometimes it's very, women, when women, um, it's that comment about being ambitious and getting different outcomes. So sometimes when women ask for pay rises, they get, it, it's, it's seen more negatively as compared to when men ask for them. So, <coughs> so what she's saying is, is that I'm aware that there is a pay gap. I'm aware that women don't get paid as much as men. So I'm just going to say, know for the first offer and I'm just saying can you do something else with that. So she's saying if you be collective and you, you step back a little bit, sometimes it's not as um, uh, confronting uh, if you can if you do it like that. Being light versus successful. So this is a really important one and this is one that I got caught on when I joined uh, when I joined consulting. So just be aware of trading the two. So you, you know there's it's being light and then there's being successful. And um, if you don't want to if you just think about what you're doing and when you're saying yes and make sure that you're saying yes for the right reasons and not saying no and then you're going to be suffering. So a, a, quite a good technique is just to say, look, thanks for asking, um, but perhaps next time we'll find somebody else if you don't particularly want to do it. And for me in consulting, I found that I, what I really wanted to do was to go to the gym at lunchtime, but um, you know, I wanted to, I was invited to go to lunch and have coffee with people and I'd just, I just rather go to the gym I didn't want to go to lunch. With, um, I didn't always want to go to lunch with so I'm um, still working through that. I haven't actually gone to the gym maybe once at lunchtime. I, I, I brought the coffee down to once a week. But I was trying to be light and, and, instead of doing what I wanted. It's a small example, but it's just important to think about it. Uh, take risks. This is the key of the, the leaning area as well. So um, sometimes women are opting out because they don't want to get hurt. So they say, I think I might want to have children in a few years. So I'll take this particular job so that it won't, uh, so then I'll be more comfortable situation or that I don't, I don't want to balance it. And she, in this book she's really saying if you're thinking about having kids, lean in really hard then because then you're going to have a great job that you want to come back to as well. Not everyone wants to do, um, everyone has different choices and everyone wants to do different things but quite often women are opting out even if they haven't had kids yet, maybe they haven't had, had kids. So I think, I think I might want to have kids so I'm going to just take a job that I think is going to be easier. Okay, what if you don't have kids? Um, if it doesn't happen for you then you've missed out on a few years of your career. And that's definitely the other thing is um, making your partner a part, a real partner. So this is an important one. When I was at the Ernst and Young talk, the women, all the women on the panel, really noted that their, their, their partner had been a real support to them. So you know, guys, if you've got um, a lady who's got a career and wants to do stuff, it's just about supporting them to be the best person that they can, um, and you know, who believes in you, who encourages you, and wants you to be the best, uh, the best version of yourself. Um, but uh, also, I think you can. On top of that, I'd add, you know, outsource what you don't like to do, so get a cleaner. <laughs> 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 so, um, the last one, I think, uh, so on the work, work life balance as well, everyone kept talking about work life balance all the time. You hear this all the time, and I'm like, what the hell is this? Work life balance thing. Uh, everyone talks about it, and apparently women talk about it more than guys, so, so I've been quite conscious about that as well. But I ended up going on a panel for, for um, Barbara, probably Barbara Cocott. And she was uh, releasing her um, releasing a book on work life balance, and she'd done a survey. So I finally got to the, the, the core of work life balance. I wanted to share that with you because it's something that I, I learned. 
Uh, and that was work life balance is different for everybody. So if you're doing more than half a day, then you want that that's unbalanced. Some people like doing 30, some people like doing 40, some people like doing 50, 60. Most people like doing about 40. Uh, she also said that this, through her studies, that part time didn't really give better balance because everyone assumed that you could do everything at home plus do the part time job. So I don't know if it's difficult as well. And people, a lot of people think, well, I'll go and start my own business and I'll get more work life balance, and that doesn't happen anyway. So, um, it, uh, so what she was recommending with that, or she also made the point that a lot of um, more caring, the solutions were around more caring um, institutions, so for childcare and aged care. And aged care um, is much harder apparently than childcare, that gets quite stressful for people. Uh, managers and professionals, and this is like a lot of people in the room actually take your leave, you can't, it's like you know, sleep deficit, you don't end up getting it back, so she really encouraged people to make sure you take your leave. Uh, and also, um, and make sure that if you are a manager, you might take people's leave so that they just don't get burnt out. So that was quite a good one. So this is the last one on the women bit. So, you know, if you hear any of those myths, just be really constructive and realise that they're, they're really just myths. If you have the opportunity to check, check metrics or know about them, then have a look at them. Support women to be the best versions of themselves. Um, be a good example. And uh, if you are looking after or supervising women, make sure they're not opting out and they're picking various different careers, encourage them to sort of to lean in and take those risks. And um, and also, if you're um, be a bit of a partner, if you can be there. Uh, I quickly wanted to talk about sustainability because I got involved with that last year, and that was another question I had. So I just said, what is everyone talking about with sustainability? So I wanted to share that quickly with you. Um, the sustainability, when they're talking about it in the in the, um, in the, the wider context, um, these millennium goals are part of that sustainability. So. Um, it was a, it's a 2015 goals, a 2015 um, millennium goals. So they wanted to solve that by 2015. And what they decided with the developing countries is that uh, giving money and giving aid is not really working. We need to help company. We need to help countries be sustainable for themselves. So these are the sorts of things that we can do. So um, you know, education, empowering women, um, mortality, health, uh, trying to stop some diseases, make sure the environments help. Healthy and try and have partnerships for development. So Australia is doing a lot of work in this area. Australia has actually got some um, government funding, and they're doing, doing a lot of work in Africa at the moment. So the guy over there, they're, they're spending time with governments. They're helping them. Um, they're helping them learn. Uh, they're helping governments say, well, we're getting all this money from a mining company. They're helping them plan for infrastructure instead of holding it in a bank because they're too scared to spend it. They're helping them get those skills and working with the communities to make sure that they've got a share. So Australia is making a really difference in this space, in the mining space. But these are some of the goals that we want. So they usually talk about the triple bottom line, um, and they'll talk about um, the economy, the environment, community, but in mining we've also got efficiency and safety, so um, there's a few different things when you actually translate it down into mining. So I wanted to say, you know, in mining, um, so, so for example in safety, it's all about risk, um, and reporting and training in economics when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about um, how we share that, how we do royalties, how we share that with the communities. Um, with the efficiency one, it's about how we extract efficiently from our mines uh, so that we get as much as possible. For the environment, it's about making sure we're looking after uh, reporting things, monitoring things, making sure that we're not sending um, acid, acid water down, down creeks. And in the community, it's around uh, having um, engagement and employment and, and being part of the community and being accepted as part of that. So there's a few things that, what that means uh, for mine. Efficiency as well as a lot about energy, so trying to be efficient and use less power. So I thought I'd just talk about three top ones. The first one is a low carbon economy, so this is about uh, reducing energy and this is probably the best one for mining companies to get involved with because early in the sustainability journey for mining companies, the best way to get it in is to say, this can also save you money. So you can do this, and guess what, it's also going to save you money. So a lot of things around ammunition uh, and truck haulage, they, they're sort of the big, the big, the big ticket items in the, in the mines. And so there's a lot of things um, that mines are doing, and a lot of mines, um, parks, parks has got on their website, that you know, their, their focus is around the farming because they're using a lot of energy there. So for us in sustainability and energy use, this is where we can make a difference, and a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are getting into this space. For the environment, uh, a key